The glorious truth is that we need him, but he is here. We don't have to go very far to find the one who is ready to meet our need. The Lord is here. The Lord is near. And as we move further into the book of James, we come to a section this morning that deals very primarily with the idea of prayer. It's been said that no believer's spiritual life will ever rise higher than his or her prayer life. So the, this passage in front of us this morning is important because it points us to something that is of utmost importance to us. We're going to be reading verses 13 through 18 in James chapter 6. Now as you listen and as you read along, just count the number of times that you find the word for prayer in these verses and see if James doesn't think it's something that matters very much to us. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Let's pray together. Father, we want this morning to hear from you. We understand that the emphasis that your word places on this opportunity and this activity called prayer makes it very important for us to understand. So would you please lead us this morning in the paths of understanding. Give us wisdom and insight about prayer, why it matters, why it's important, how it needs to become such an important and critical part of our living. So we commit this time to you, and we say with everything in us, Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. I must say to you that of all of the subjects that we talk about in here, that this particular subject is one that I desire to approach this morning with a, a great sense of the urgency and the importance of us grasping the truth from God's Word related to prayer. I want you to see this morning along with me what makes this passage of Scripture critical for this hour in our lives. The question was asked of a devout Scotsman, do you expect to go to heaven? His answer kind of shocked the one who asked the question. His unexpected reply was this, why sir, I live there. Now what he was speaking about was the presence of a relationship with Jesus Christ that was so intimate, that was so near, that was so alive, that his anticipation of heaven was something like he was already experiencing. This is a, an intimacy with God, an intimacy with Christ that is unfamiliar to many, but it's beautifully illustrated in another story that I want to share with you. It's told by a man named Dr. Parks Cadman. He tells this story about two other men, a man named Horace Bushnell and a man named Reverend Joseph Twitchell. Bushnell was suffering from a terrible disease. And one evening, Reverend Joseph Twitchell went to visit him. And as they sat together under the evening stars, Bushnell said, one of us ought to pray. Twitchell asked Bushnell to do that. And as he began praying, he buried his face in the earth. And he poured out his heart unto the Heavenly Father. And Twitchell, in recalling the incident, said this. He poured out his heart 
so much before God that I was afraid to stretch out my hand in the darkness lest I should touch God. To have God this near is to enter into the Holy of Holies. It's to breathe the fragrance of the heavenly air. It's to walk in Eden's delightful gardens. Nothing but prayer can bring God and man into this intimate, happy communion. Many have borne witness to this same sweet fellowship whenever prayer has become the one habit of life that meant more to them than anything else. And so we come to some of the final verses in James's letter to the church. And here he stresses prayer as a way of life. In every verse that we read, he mentioned prayer. And in one verse, he mentioned it twice. So in these verses, in concluding his instructions and encouragement to the church, he brings prayer to the, to the surface and he shines the spotlight on it. And it's as, as though he's saying, all the things that I've said to you, Everything that I've written to you, all the instruction I've given you, all the encouragement that's been before you will amount to nothing if it is not bathed in prayer, if it is not centered in a life that is focused on prayer. And so I want to say to you this morning that James is stressing that prayer is a way of life for believers because he knew what I want us to know this morning. And that is very simply that prayer places human limitation in the wheelhouse of God's limitless power. Every one of us at some point in our lives will find ourselves at the end of ourselves. For some, that may not be a very far journey to make. For others, you may be able to go on and on and to press on and on in your own strength. But at some point, you will find yourself at the end of yourself. But I want to tell you something. When you're at the end of yourself, you're at the place where God is only beginning. And what God will do for us if we come to him with a realization that prayer is a vehicle, prayer is a means to connect with him, to understand him, and for him to understand and to speak to us and to communicate with us, if, if our lives will become a life of prayer, and prayer is not some activity that we attach to other parts of our journey, then we'll see things happen in our lives that are undescribable and unexplainable. See, sometimes I think that we treat prayer like it may be uh, an email that we send to somebody and we, we hope they open it. You know, we just send God an email prayer and we, and we hope that somehow it gets through. Somehow there's communication that happens. Or we may treat it sort of like a social media post that we just put out there and hope maybe somehow God likes it and we want God to like it. Who all's liked my prayer today? Has God liked it yet? We want him to like our prayer. Or, or maybe we want it to be uh, more like a, a, a Twitter where, a tweet where we can do, do it all in about a hundred and whatever number of characters it is and we're done with prayer. But I want you to know that James is encouraging here not, not for us to learn how to say prayers, but for us to learn how to live a life of prayer. For, for our lives to be a, a constant communion with God. Paul says it this way, pray without ceasing. Now, he's saying live a life of prayer. Let prayer be in your life at all times. So in these verses, the priority of prayer is brought before us by James. He, he basically thinks of prayer as something that is of critical, urgent importance in the life of every believer. And so in these verses that we read, in this letter that's written by James, he mentions prayer over and over and over again. By the way, did you know that James himself was a serious practitioner of prayer? He's not writing about something that he hasn't experienced. You know, y'all know what James's nickname was, don't you? Anybody know? Anybody want to venture a guess? It wasn't prayer warrior. They called James old camel knees. Now, here's a, here's a fun exercise for you. Google camel knees. And, and it'll show you camels and how they get down and, and get up. They, they go down on their knees, but their knees are just knobby knees. The reason that they called James old camel knees was because he spent so much time on his knees in prayer that his knees began to look like the knees of a camel. He believed in it. He practiced it. It was an experience that was his life. And so prayer here is encouraged by James, and it's encouraged in every single circumstance in life. He mentions three that are general circumstances, and, and we'll look at these 
very briefly, very quickly, and see what he's talking about. The first time he, sa- he, he begins to speak about it in verse 13, he says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Now, this idea of suffering here speaks about just the generic troubles of life that become so, so much pressure upon us that they create within us a sense of, of anxiety or stress or oppression, something that's pressing in on us. And, and sometimes we don't find ourselves living in that moment. We don't find ourselves in that reality. But this is that broad spectrum of being troubled in difficult times, of being challenged by some sort of calamity that is visiting your life. And so we need to understand that whenever these kinds of things happen, whenever the stresses of life begin to grip us, that prayer is the place that we find ourselves. It was John Chrysostom who said these words, the potency of prayer has subdued the strength of fire. It has bridled the rage of lions. It has hushed anarchy to rest. It has extinguished wars. It has appeased the elements. It has expelled demons. It has burst the chains of death. It's expanded the gates of heaven. It's assuaged diseases, repelled frauds, rescued cities from destruction, stayed the sun in its course, and arrested the progress of the thunderbolt. Prayer is an all-efficient panoply, a treasure undiminished, a mind that is never exhausted, a sky unobscured by clouds, clouds, a heaven unruffled by the storm. It is the root, the fountain, the mother of a thousand blessings. Now, if prayer is all that, don't you think it's a good place for you to take whatever calamitous incident in your life is pressing in upon you and to leave it there at the feet of Jesus? That's what prayer does. It moves us into proximity with the one who can meet the needs of our experience. So he says, in times of suffering, let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? That's a question. I'm, I'm guessing maybe not many of us, maybe. I don't know. It's okay to smile in church. It's okay to do that, okay? It's okay to be happy here because we're in a happy place. This is a place where the people of God are able to come into the presence of God and rejoice in the deliverance of God, in the strength of God in our lives. But here he says, in those times... When you're emotively upbeat, when you have a peace of mind that that has settled in upon you and your life seems to be on an even keel, he says, what do you do? Let him sing psalms. The word there is the Greek word P-S-A-L-L-O, which means a psalm to be sung, singing a psalm to God. This is a word that speaks to us about offering our praises to God, lifting our hearts in praise. You do know. That praise is a prayer to God of thanksgiving and gratitude and recognition and acknowledgement to him. And he says, in times of joyfulness, praise God. The thrust of these verses reveals that the sorrows and the joys, the ups and downs are all part of the experiences of life in the body of Christ. Prayer and praise are the responses that he begins to talk to the church about. By the way, you do, you do know that sometimes a reminder to turn to God in the times of cheer is sometimes more necessary, more needed than it is in times of suffering. Because sometimes whenever everything's going well, we just kind of leave God out of the equation if we're not careful. But he says, when you're cheerful, you turn to God. And you rejoice in the presence of God. And you rejoice in the blessing of God upon your life. Then he mentions in verse 14 another incident which he would encourage prayer within. Verse number 14, is anyone among you sick? Then he goes into this this process for dealing with this particular thing. In times of sickness, he says, you need to turn to God. By the way, we know, we know of having walked this journey with people that are near and dear to us, some of you having lived it yourselves, that sickness is really the rawest edge of human need. But he says this, if anyone among you, that word anyone suggests that this is an open-ended opportunity. What he's about to say, what he's about to offer is open-ended. It's extended to anyone who is in the body of Christ. It is an open-ended opportunity. But he says this, is is, is anyone among you sick? The word for sickness here speaks about a, a constancy of weakness that has gripped the body. Someone who is terribly ill. And so the the implication here is that just because we're believers, that doesn't mean that we are immune 
to the weaknesses and the frailties of the flesh. Believers also will become ill. That's what he says. And so if anybody tries to tell you that if you become ill, that there's something wrong with your faith, you tell them, no, the scripture says that believers get sick too, because they do. But he says that whenever you become sick, what you do is you take that sickness and you entrust it to God. And he says, if you're terribly sick, he gives us here this process that we need to put in place that we need to understand is available for those who are believers. And so let's just get into it. The, the initiative basically for the process rests with the individual who is facing the sickness. He says, if anyone among you is sick, let him or her, as the case may be. So right now, the initiative is shifted to the person who's got the illness, the person who is sick. If this person is infirm, then they are the ones who need to do what he's about to instruct could be done. So let him do what? Call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And every Baptist just gasped. <laughs> really? No, that's right here in the Bible. That is right here in the Bible. So let's kind of pick this apart and see what, what's happening here. First of all, he talks about who to call. He says, these are the ones who ought to be invited in or included in this particular process. He calls them the elders of the church. Now, certainly in James's day, that was a specific office within the church, but it's, it applies basically to those who were the, the known and appointed and accepted leaders within the church. This was a, a group of people who were not necessarily endued with any special kind of power, but certainly who had a special position or place in the church. And they were called to come in, and Scripture says to pray over the one who is infirm, the one who is sick. Now, this suggests gathering around the individual. So now, here's the, here's the way this is unfolding. You have the sick person who is notifying the elders of the church of that sickness and saying, I need prayer. And so the elders of the church then go to this person and gather, they go to this person and they gather where this person is and they pray over that person. In other words, they, they gather around and they begin to pray for that person in that person's presence. And then scripture says, anointing with oil. Now, that's pretty simplistic. It's just exactly what it says. Anointing with oil. This is... Uh, uh, a word that is used to refer to the olive oil that was used. The question has always come up and been asked, is this something that is medicinal or is it something that is miraculous? Well, let me tell you that from the time this passage was written, it's been debated from then until now. And you'll have some people who say that it's one and some people who say that it's the other. But I want to say this to you, that what it is, is it's symbolic. In this instance in Scripture, it is a symbol. It's like the elements of the Lord's Supper. It's like the water of baptism. It basically is acting in faith on what the command of Scripture says that ought to be done. And so in doing this, it becomes a symbol. It's not something that has magical powers in it. It's, it's not to be treated superstitiously. It's to be acted upon obediently. And so as, as the, the elders of the church are called in and they begin to pray and anoint with oil... They do this in the name of Jesus. The invocation of the name of Jesus is the other part of this process. So you have the process where the initiative is resting with the person who's sick. The instruction is to call in the elders of the church and to pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of Jesus. And the impact is that God may do these things. What does it say? The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. So the impact of this is that God may do these things. There may be physical healing where the person is literally delivered from their disease. There may be a reinvigoration where the person is raised up. The person has a, a renewed sense of energy. And, and, I, and I've seen this happen, and you may have too, where when a person is sick, maybe in their sick bed, and, and they're prayed for, prayed over, that this person has this renewed sense of vitality and energy. The disease may not be completely gone, but they, they're able to find reinvigoration and be re-energized for a season, and the disease may visit again. And then he says the third thing that may happen is that there may be a sense of spiritual renewal. Their sins may be forgiven from them, for, of them. If he's committed sins, he'll be forgiven. Basically, the idea here is that whenever this person surrenders themselves so completely to the will of God 
and the belief and trust that God is going to do what's best on their behalf, that they're yielding themselves in trust and in compliance and in obedience to God, and that is the remedy for sin being forgiven. We surrender our heart, our mind, our will to Him, and we trust Him to bring forgiveness to our lives. So there's a sense of spiritual renewal that may happen here. Now, here, here's where, here's where the, the, the problem comes up for most people. Well, we did that and they didn't get well. We did that and they didn't get well. Let me tell you something. Whenever someone is sick, and, and I know that many, many people in this room, myself included, have gone through that with people that we love, people that we care about, and we prayed for them, and some of them didn't get well in this life. But I want to tell you something. Anytime that happens, it is always connected to the purposes of God and never related to the power of God. God's purpose always transcends. You remember as we've been reading in James that he says when you pray, you always pray according to the will of the Lord, whatever God's will is. And we, we have to trust in the sovereign will of God, but we also have to act on the processes that he's placed in front of us. And so if he says, you do this, you pray in faith, and he chooses something different than the prayer you've prayed, then you just know that his purposes, his will was different in that moment in time. And you trust him in his sovereignty. So, he comes to us here, and he speaks to us about the ability to pray in faith and to trust, to place it in the hands of God, to do so in obedience to the word of Scripture. There's a news story that was carried several years ago in 2008 by the Associated Press. It was about two pilots in New Zealand who were flying a home-built micro-light airplane. And they were high over this sloping valley near a rugged section of New Zealand when, guess what, their engine started sputtering and it coughed and it died. They evidently had run out of fuel. The newspaper quoted one of the men as saying this, my friend and I are both Christians, and so our immediate reaction to a life-threatening situation was to ask God for his help. The two men prayed that somehow they would glide over the ridge and maybe there find a safe landing place on the other side. Well, guess what? Somehow they managed to make it over the ridge, and they found a grassy slope, a grassy strip, and they managed to land their plane on that strip safe and sound. It was almost a miraculous answer to prayer. I would even eliminate the word almost. But as they rolled to a stop on this grassy strip of land, they looked up, and right there in front of them was a giant billboard, a 20-foot tall sign, and the words on that sign said this, Jesus is Lord. I want to tell you something. If they had crashed and met their death, Jesus is still Lord. Because he's Lord. He's Lord over life. He's Lord over things that you and I can't see or understand. He's Lord over sickness. He's Lord over death. He's Lord over health. He's Lord over breath. He's Lord over everything. And so we have to trust him when outcomes may not be what we would have preferred. I, I never will forget my sweet mother, as she shared with my oldest, my firstborn son, about what was happening in her life, that she was moving quickly and rapidly toward the end of her life, much younger than any of us would have imagined. And she sat him down and she said, Michael, I want you to know that this is not what any of us wanted. We've prayed for God to alleviate this. But it appears that it's his will that I'm going to go on home. And we have to be okay with that. I thought, wow, that's powerful. Uh, that is powerful. And, and, and I learned a lesson there that you don't get in Sunday school every day. I learned that your faith in God has to be absolute, regardless of what the outcome turns out to be. And so we see the power of prayer. It's a priority in our lives. It's something necessary in our lives. And the purpose of God, more than our preferences, determine the exercise or the withholding of healing. That's in God's hands. So prayer... It's important to us. Prayer is, is a priority to us. Prayer is encouraged in every circumstance. But we also want to see here that prayer is effective under the correct circumstances and conditions. He says here that, con, that those who come to this place of prayer in verse number 16 are to confess 
trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So he basically says that we come to the place of of trusting in God and praying to God for something to happen that's beyond ourselves, that we're trying to take our limitations and put them in the wheelhouse of God's limitless power. He says we must do so with a clean heart. We can't come with a dirtied up heart and expect God to to receive and to hear and to respond to our prayers. If you don't believe that, read Isaiah chapter 59. Because it says very clearly that the Lord's hand is not shortened and his ear is not heavy that he can't hear. But your iniquities have created a distance between you and your God so that he will not hear your prayers. And we can't expect to come to God with a messed up, dirty, cluttered up heart and, and to achieve the result that he says must come from a clean heart. So he says, confess your sins. It means to confess from the heart the reality of, of, our, of our shortcomings, of our failures. We have to come to the place where we own this, with frankness, the fondness that we have for the flesh. That we admit our fallenness before God. That, that we get inside of ourselves until we get right with God. He says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. There has to be that condition in our lives of of being right in the sight of God for our prayers to to arrive where they need to arrive and to accomplish what what they can accomplish. And so we come with a desire for God to make us right so that our prayers can be effective, so that our fervent prayers can accomplish what we desire. So, we have this clean heart that must be part of the condition. We also have a confident faith that must be part of the condition. He says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. How many of us have just kind of prayed as a last resort? We just kind of throw that up there and say, well, God, I I know you can, but, but I'm not sure you will. But if you will, fine. If you won't, I guess I'll have to live with it. But we don't really pray trusting that God, we're not confident in God's ability and God's power to alleviate, to reveal, to guide, to, to touch, to move, to do whatever he does. So we have to come with a clean heart. We have to come with a confident faith, a distinct belief that we're asking God to do something that is certainly within the scope of his ability and that we pray is within the scope of his will. And so we have a confident faith. We have a faith in God's promise that prayer can do things. We have a confidence in God's product that a man, when he prays, makes a difference. He he gives us an example here of an ordinary man A man who, with nature like ours, a man named Elijah, when he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain, it didn't rain on the land for three years and six months. Where was Elijah last night when the flooding came? Where was he? (laughs) Think about it. This man prayed, and and, and he prayed according to the word of the Lord, and the judgment of God was, was exactly what he prayed. It didn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prayed again, and guess what? It flooded. But he was a man with a nature just like ours. That's what Scripture says. And we have to come to the belief that that Elijah had no more opportunity or no more privilege and no more power in prayer than is available to us. That's what he's telling the people here. That's what James is saying, that when we pray, we have the same opportunity, the same chance to, to touch the portals of heaven as Elijah himself. He was just a man that was natural, normal, but he had an extraordinary prayer life. That's the difference. That's the difference. There's a lady named Pearl Good who lived in Pasadena, California. She was a private nurse, and in 1949, she was taking care of a millionaire. And one day, she picked up a newspaper, and she saw a clipping about an evangelistic meeting that was taking place in L.A. under a big tent at the corner of Hill and Washington Streets. After she got off work at 5 in the afternoon, she drove down there and found a parking place and went to the meeting. The tent was filled and running over. And Pearl was moved by the preacher. He was a young evangelist who was largely unknown to the world. You know him. His name's Billy Graham. Until 1949 crusade, he wasn't well known. But that crusade moved him and catapulted him to the attention of the whole world. She began to get involved in the prayer meetings that took place every day. And some of the participants in this crusade would meet for earnest prayer, what James called fervent prayer. And one day they had a great prayer meeting which became sort of confessional. Pearl got up and this is what she said. I want to make a confession. 
that I've been accustomed down through my life since I was converted at age 17 to often spend nights in prayer and days in prayer and fasting. That's what I was taught. That's what I was trained to do. I saw it in the Bible. But she says this, now my children are married and I'm alone and I don't have quite the burden. She was 65 years old at the time and she had been lulled by the thought that she had just let up on some personal all-night prayer meetings and now she felt convicted that she had weakened in her ministry of intercession so she confessed that to the group. When she sat down, a younger woman got up and said, I closed my beauty salon today to come here to pray to find God's help to find a good spiritual church to go to. I want to go to a spiritual church. I'm saved. Lady, would you pray with me all night? And that night during the Los Angeles crusade, 38 people prayed all night until sunup. During that time, Pearl Good, this 65-year-old nurse, developed a burden to pray for Billy Graham. This was, her, this was her words. He was just a boy, she said later. He was just a boy. God spoke to me about him. He showed me and told me that he would preach all over the world. And he was called as no other man would be called in this age to preach the gospel. And he must preach all over the world. But my job was to pray for him. For the next 23 years, until her death at age 88, Pearl Good prayed for Billy Graham. During the early years... Uh, of, of that time, she paid for her own way and traveled over 48,000 miles on Greyhound buses traveling secretly to the city where he was preaching. She would rent a motel room and she would pray night and day for the success of the meetings. She didn't go sightseeing. She didn't let anyone know she was there. She traveled there in Billy Graham's shadow, even to overseas locations. She missed her children's birthdays and her grandchildren's birthdays. She believed she was on divine assignment. She called it a hidden ministry. And eventually it became known to the members of the Billy Graham team who happened to notice that this little old lady was always around at the prayer tent during the morning hours. They made contact with her and found out what was going on. From that point on, they paid her expense to come to the meetings, but they never interfered with her hidden ministry. And her prayers helped launch a ministry that spanned six decades and perhaps saw millions of people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. She wasn't anyone special. She was just a normal person like you, like me. But she took prayer seriously. And she gave her heart and her life to this extraordinary venture of praying for God to do something special through a man. I'd say that prayer was answered. So, the priority of prayer. Do you have the priority of prayer in your life? Let's think in these last moments about what I would call the privilege of prayer. The privilege of prayer is, I think, emphasized for us as we look at how prominent it is in biblical history. When you begin to think about the saints of old, you go through the, the scripture, you go through the Bible, and what you're going to find is that prayer is Abraham on the escarpment overlooking the Dead Sea engaged in an animated conversation with the Lord about the impending destruction of Sodom. Did he stop too soon? Well, only Lot and his daughters were saved, but they were saved. Prayers Jacob in a desperate midnight struggle from which he emerges physically lame, but spiritually victorious. A lame, but a new man. Prayers Moses, the mediator, meeting with God out on the backside of a desert, pleading with God for the stubborn and rebellious people in the wilderness, astonishing, with astonishing selflessness, he would pray and offer himself in death if the people could be saved. Prayers Gideon, the least member of his family from the weakest clan of Manasseh, asking God twice for a sign that he was really going to use him to rescue Israel. Prayers Hannah, crying bitterly and in such deep distress that the priest Eli thought she was drunk in the temple and began to rebuke her. And her desperate prayer was answered. And out of that prayer came a, young, a man named Samuel, who was one of the greatest prophets that Israel ever knew. Prayers David, firmly established as king, secure on his throne, peace all around, the recipient of wonderful promises, covenant promises from God. And, and he's grateful to God, he's grateful to God that God would choose to make his name great. Prayer Solomon, kneeling before the altar in the completed temple with his hands spread out towards heaven, aware that the largest sky cannot contain this God to whom he prays, yet he begs the Lord to draw near to his people for his name's sake. Prayer is Elijah there on Mount Carmel whenever, whenever the, uh, the prophets of Baal were taunting and teasing and begging their God to respond. And Elijah prays and orders his sacrifice to be drenched with water and ask God to rain down fire 
fire from heaven, and he consumes the altar and the sacrifice. Prayer is Hezekiah, the king of a small kingdom, receiving a bullying letter from the king of Assyria asking him to surrender. And he spreads out his hands before the Lord, and he receives an overwhelming answer. Prayer is King Jehoshaphat marching in the battle against foreign hordes with a vanguard singing, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Prayer is Ezra sitting appalled until the time of the evening sacrifice with torn clothes and falling on his knees before the Lord and asking him for mercy for a faithless people. Prayer is a concourse of Israelites in Nehemiah's time fasting, wearing sackcloth and ashes with dust on their heads, spending a quarter of a day reading the law and a quarter of a day in confession and worship, reviewing their history, stained as it was with disobedience, praying for mercy and renewing their pledge of loyalty. Prayers Isaiah lifting his eyes to God from the standpoint of the Jewish evils and protesting, saying, where are your zeal and your might? Your tenderness and compassion are withheld from us. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Do not be angry beyond measure. Prayers Daniel, already for many decades a king's advisor, faced by yet another plot against him by jealous court underlings, imperturbably continuing his habit of prayer three times a day, even though it would be a threat to his life. Prayer is Jonah. Prayer is Jonah pleading with God from the belly of the great fish asking him to hear his prayer. Prayer is Habakkuk in a country overrun by godless foreign armies singing to himself again the story of Exodus, praying for God to act in such a wonderful way as he did on his people in days gone by. I want to tell you that the history of God's people is a history of prayer. It is a history of prayer. It is a history of people who saw the conditions or the circumstances, whatever they might be, whether they were personal, like Hezekiah when he turned to the wall and prayed to God and asked for an extension of his own life, or whether it was praying for the extension of the life of a nation, or whether it was praying for victory over the enemies. They would all say together, like the kings of old, whenever they would plead with God and say something like this, Lord, our God, we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And and to plead and to pray with God for deliverance in, in circumstances and situations that were greater than they could ever imagine. Asa cried out to the Lord and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help, whether with many or with those who have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest in you, and in your name we go against this multitude. You are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. I want you to know that prayer is a privilege, that God has afforded to every believer. It's provided for me and it's provided for you. And the question is, is the prayer of our lives that needs to be prayed this morning a prayer of confession and repentance for not praying? Are we slack? Have we minimized something that God has maximized? Have we belittled something that God has said, this is your lifeline? See, believers ought not to have prayer in their life, believers ought to have a life of prayer where we live and dwell in the presence of God. Where for us to pray is to do something that is so familiar and so regular and so much a part of who we are that it is as normal as breathing air. It is as normal as eating food or drinking water. Let's pray. Father, we We bow before you now with maybe some heightened sense of awareness and understanding at this moment that we don't pray enough. We don't pray as we should. Forgive us, please. Help us to realize that busyness and activity never will take the place of effective and fervent prayer from a righteous heart. So, Lord, first of all, we need to ask you to search us, just like David did. Search me, O God, and know my heart today. And see if there's any way in me that is wicked, that needs cleansing. Father, if there's any wicked way in me, please turn my heart to you. May we all pray that way right now. And, Father, as we become right in your sight, then... Help us to laser our focus in on a prayer life, a life of prayer, walking with you moment by moment, 
moment by moment, not day by day, but moment by moment until we know that you are really right here with us. That you're by our side. You're surrounding us. You're covering us. Father, it may be that there's somebody in this room today that has not yet trusted Jesus as their only Savior. They've, they've never come in confession of sin and repentance toward God. And today, as we pray, Father, we pray for them. We ask you, Lord, to awaken in their hearts the awareness of the depths of your love, the greatness of your mercy, the enormity of your compassion. And may they respond to you today just honestly saying, I need a Savior, I need Jesus. And Father, if maybe that's happened but they've not publicly confessed you, maybe today's the day they need to come and just say, I want everybody to know that I've trusted Jesus and I want to follow him and I want everyone to know that I'm not ashamed of that. Father, there could be a lot of things that are going on in people's minds right now, but I pray that you'll move us, and if you need to move us to the altar where we spend the time of prayer today, please just let, let the clock not matter right now. Let nothing matter except what's happening between you and our hearts. May we find ourselves willing to, to bow before you in humility and surrender. In Jesus' name I pray.